Welcome to Almost Here, Around the Corner of Future Technology podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies poised to transform our lives for better or worse are the focus of this podcast. Almost Here means these technologies are now here and starting to be used. We're just around the corner from Bitcoin to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more. The Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Altcoin Super Conference is coming to Dallas, Texas, February 16th, 17th, and 18th, 2018. If you know of a better way to get the latest insider knowledge about crypto, to hear directly from the top minds in this field, to interact personally with 800 fellow crypto lovers, hodlers, investors, miners, traders, developers, and founders, then I'd like to hear about it. If you don't, then you don't want to miss out. Register today for the Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Altcoin Super Conference. Just go to bitcoinsuperconference.com and register today to qualify for super early bird rates, the lowest rates on tickets and hotel rooms. That's bitcoinsuperconference.com. Hey, this is Richard Jacobs with Future Tech Podcast. Uh, my guest today is Judith Campisi, a professor uh, in several areas. We're going to be talking about senescent cells. Uh, Judith, how are you doing? Very good. Thank you. Yeah, um, I apologize. I didn't have it in my uh, show notes. Would you mind uh, just telling the audience a little bit about your background and, and what you're working on right now? Uh huh. So I'm a professor at the Buck Institute for Research on Aging and also a senior scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And we work mostly on the interface between aging and cancer. And we work in this area by studying a stress response that is called cellular senescence. And what this stress response does is um, it protects us from cancer. It's well known that that's the case. But with age, senescent cells begin to accumulate. And now there's very strong evidence that at least in mice, um, those senescent cells that accumulate with age can drive a number of age-related diseases, including, very ironically, uh, late-life cancer. So can we back up just a little bit? What is a senescent cell and how do cells become that way? Good, good question. Cells become senescent usually when they undergo some form of stress. Often, those stresses put the cell at risk for becoming a cancer cell. So what happens is in response to this potential cancer-causing stress, the cells enact a program. They turn on a program, and what that program does first is it shuts down the ability of that cell to undergo proliferation. So that's clear then why this would be protective against cancer, because that senescent cell now can no longer divide, and a cell that cannot divide cannot go on to form a tumor. The problem is that the cells also are trying to be really good neighbors, and so they want to signal to their neighbors that there's a problem. I've been stressed. I'm shutting myself down. But you guys that are not stressed, you need to be prepared to repair the tissue or help the tissue regenerate if there's a problem. And so the senescent cell then secondarily begins to secrete molecules that alert the neighboring cells. Now, in the short term, that's good. In the short term, it helps tissue repair. It helps wound healing. But in the long term, when those cells are chronically present, and that's what happens during aging, is they slowly build up and then they're chronically present. They're chronically sending out these signals. And at that point, um, the tissue becomes what has been termed chronically inflamed. And chronic inflammation, although it is in the short term beneficial because it helps tissue repair, when it's chronic and low level, it is destructive. And virtually every major age-related disease has as a component, either as a cause or as a uh, exacerbator, this condition called chronic inflammation. So the way we think about senescence is that it's a, it's a double-edged sword. And it's an evolutionary trade-off. It was it evolved for the good purpose of preventing cancer and promoting tissue repair. Of course, for most of our evolutionary history, we didn't live very long. So the fact that these cells build up slowly and accumulate with age was irrelevant. 
evolution never had to deal with that problem because most deaths occurred before the age of 40, and it occurred because not because of disease, but because of predation and starvation and infection. And so we're stuck now with this evolutionary trade-off that we're trying to beat back and try to get those cells to either go away or to stop secreting those molecules that cause inflammation. Have you looked at the trajectory of senescent cells? Like when do they start appearing in an organism? And is it just a steady increase or do they are they kept at a certain level and then after a certain age they break out and they start increasing? What does the profile look like or have you studied it? Well, it has been studied partially. We and other labs have been studying this for a while. Uh, We don't have very, very hard answers. So first of all, we don't know very much in humans because we can't really do experiments in humans. We can only observe. So very early on when we first um, were identifying markers that allowed us to identify cells as being senescent or not, and we did do a study in human tissue. And it seemed that somewhere around the ages of 50 to 60, I mean, people are very variable, right? So it's very hard to say for sure when things start because people are different. But somewhere around 50 or 60 years of age is when we began to see noticeable increase in the number of senescent cells. This was in skin, but not sun-exposed skin. It was protected skin. Since that time, people have looked in a whole bunch of human and mouse tissues. The data are much clearer in mice. We can eliminate a lot of the environmental and genetic variability of humans by working with mice that are kept in a similar environment and have the same genetics. And in the case of mice, it seems to be that there's very few or uh, minimally detectable senescent cells before about one year of age. So the general rule of thumb is one year of age in a mouse is equivalent to 30 to 40 years in a human. Um, And then after that, the number of senescent cells goes up. And it, it doesn't necessarily go up linearly, but it's not like a catastrophic burst at some particular age. It goes up slightly exponentially. And it's just inexorable. It just goes up and up and up. Now, we also know there are ways that the body has of trying to eliminate those cells. And it's mostly through the immune system. And what we're not sure of, what is really not known, is whether this rise with age is because they're being made at a faster rate or because the immune system is less efficient at clearing them, or some combination of both. It could be. It could easily be a combination of both. We're just not sure right now. Well, maybe the immune system, like you said, if it's getting rid of the senescent cells, maybe the immune cells themselves are becoming senescent and less effective. That that can happen. It, it certainly has been shown for some immune cells that they can become senescent themselves. And it's also known that immune capacity declines with age. That's why older people are more susceptible to infection. Um, But biology is never simple, right? So the immune system can be very broadly classified into two main types, the so-called innate immune system and the so-called adaptive immune system. The innate immune system is very ancient, and it is designed to be the first line of defense against a potential invading pathogen, or injury. And what happens is the injured or infected tissue begins to secrete molecules that call innate immune cells to the site of the injury. And those innate cells are designed to kill a potential invading pathogen nonspecifically. So they make products like hydrogen peroxide and bleach hoping to kill non-specifically. Now, that is a short-term fix. You definitely don't want your tissues exposed to these damaging molecules all the time. So in the meantime, the adaptive immune system, which has evolved much more recently, uh, begins to design those very specific molecules that will kill 
with some specificity. So those are the ones that make antibodies and those T cells that recognize specific antigens. But that takes a couple of days. So the innate immune system rushes in, tries to kill nonspecifically to give the adaptive immune system time, and then the adaptive immune system takes over. Now, what happens with chronic inflammation is it is mostly the innate immune cells that are giving rise to the chronic inflammation. And what happens with age is it's mostly the adaptive immune system that declines. So we're still trying to understand what happens during aging to the innate immune system. Maybe it becomes hyperactive to try to compensate for this loss of adaptive immunity. It's really unclear right now how those two immune systems interplay, but the net result is clear. Senescent cells do accumulate with age. That's now clear in mice and humans as well. Um, interesting. What is yeah. inflammation? What what when some when uh, tissue is inflamed, literally, you know, I've I've well, I've seen it. Like my knee right now swelled up because I hurt it, so it's inflamed. Yeah. Different kinds of inflammation, yeah. and literally, what's going on? Why is there fluid buildup in an area? And you know, what is inflammation? What is it made of? Well, it's made up of um, these innate immune cells that are trying to to be the first line of defense. And then the tissue responds, right? The tissue is being damaged. And so there is, so there, so when you cut yourself, for example, and it turns bright red and you get a little bit of, of fluid buildup, that's acute inflammation and that's really essential. You, you can't heal a wound without that response. But then it dies down. And if it doesn't die down completely, you have this condition called chronic inflammation that usually doesn't involve much swelling or anything, but nonetheless, those damaging cells are there and they're slowly but inexorably damaging the tissue. So the way to think about inflammation is the way we think a lot about aging, which is that again, it's a double-edged sword. There's a good part to it and then something that becomes what we term maladaptive. It no longer is um, promoting the health of the organism and can drive disease. So the, the, the inflammation that we have um, in chronic diseases of aging is the so-called low-level chronic inflammation. It's not easy to detect. A doctor can't look at you and say, oh, you're undergoing chronic inflammation. A pathologist could if he had biopsies of your tissues because what mm. pathologists typically do is they'll take that tissue, put it under the microscope, and look for the low-level infiltration of those innate immune cells. So it's not easy to know whether you're chronically inflamed or not. It is easy to know whether you're acutely inflamed because, as you said, you get swelling and it gets red and, and it's pretty clear that something's going on. Is there a part of the body where you could do like a cheek swab, let's say, and look at the cells to see if you're inflamed all over? No, all that would tell you is whether your cheek was inflamed, which it may or may not be. No, it, it's not that easy, really. Um, people are trying to develop biomarkers um, that could be used to, say, take a blood sample and get a rough assessment of whether there's chronic systemic inflammation in that patient. The way most people who are working on that now are thinking is that it would never be a single marker. Like, let's look at protein X. And if you have certain level of protein X, your inflammation is acceptable. If it's 10X, it's a condition of chronic inflammation. We really need a battery of markers because, again, especially with people there's a lot of variability. People are, you know, we refuse to inbreed and we have very variable environments. And so we have to take into account the extreme variability among people. And so usually they'll, I mean, people are working on this now, trying to develop a panel of markers that would allow, say, a geriatrician to assess the state of chronic inflammation. We're not there yet, but it, it's coming. I think it will come. So what's what's the... I guess it's silly I haven't asked, where do you want to go with your research? What in particular are you hoping to figure out or solve? Well, we're still, there's still a lot of basic biology we do not understand 
about senescent cells. So a large part of our research effort is to drill down and understand that biology as best we can. From a practical point of view, it's very important that we understand as much as we can because there will be therapies. There are already um, prototypes, not drugs that are ready for people, but prototype drugs that have been are being tested in mice to try to get senescent cells to die, to get them to go away. And the idea would be that that would lower the burden of, of chronic inflammation and lower the incidence of chronic age-related disease. It, it works reasonably well in mice. Mice are not people, so we have a long way to go before we translate between mice and people. But at, in mice, it's, it's pretty promising. And as I said, there are drugs now that are being tested and being used to see which specific diseases are more or less vulnerable. But the reason why we want to understand as much as possible about senescent cells is because, as I said in the beginning, they're a double-edged sword. There are some times when they are beneficial. So we recently showed that during wound healing, senescent cells appear at the site of the wound, and there they're doing a good thing. They're making a growth factor that helps that wound heal. And so we need to understand how the good parts and the bad parts are controlled so that we can do no harm when we eliminate these cells, which, as I said, in mice is showing promise for a number of age-related uh, diseases, including uh, these cancer recurrence and cancer um, metastases, which is, you know, the major reason why people die of cancer, old, old age cancers now. Have you seen modulators of the um, the rate of senescence, you know, diet, uh, you know, with mice, I would think you can control everything. So have there been studies yeah. that look at changing the trajectory of their senescence? Yes, people are doing that. And we're doing a little bit of that. There are interventions that help. Um, one of them is so-called caloric restriction. This is one of the most uh, reliable ways to extend lifespan, at least in some mice and lower organisms. It's it, it's not something that people will readily do voluntarily because it's pretty severe caloric restriction. But it does seem that that regimen um, lowers the incidence of either of senescent cells or of the bad stuff that they're secreting. And we, we understand the mechanism a little bit about how that works. The other possibility, one that we're beginning to explore a little bit more in depth, is exercise, which is probably the best thing that people can do to improve their health is moderate exercise. I mean, not running, not doing triathlons, but um, moderate, consistent exercise seems to be one that have some of the best and most wide, um, widely um, distributed health benefits for mice and people in, in epidemiological studies that have been done. So we think that those interventions do have an effect on senescent cells. We don't really understand how they work completely, and we also don't understand whether they're really eliminating those cells or preventing them from secreting bad stuff. We, we just don't know. This is, this is why we're studying this process so much in detail. I mean, of course, what would be wonderful is if we could find a drug or an intervention that would mimic caloric restriction or mimic exercise. Then you can eat your McDonald's and sit on the couch and not do any exercise and take your pill and live for, you know, live healthy. Um, you can argue whether that's ethical or not, but, but the idea is, is that we want to be able to understand enough so that if there are drug interventions, they do no harm. That That's the main goal. Have you observed that uh, the amount of senescent cells varies depending on the tissue? Uh, you know, the yes. liver more, the heart yes. less. What have you seen? Yes. Yes. So this is what is so interesting. There is a component of aging, which, for lack of a better word, we call stochastic variability. And what that means is that there is a, a component of aging that is just chance, basically. So we can take genetically identical mice, 
even mice that have been housed in the same cage, certainly they're all housed in the same room. And when we look for the presence of senescent cells in different tissues, it varies from mouse to mouse. So in some mice, it's higher in the kidney. In other mice, it's higher in the skin. In some mice, it's higher in the brain. And what that says is that the stresses that may drive cells into senescence um, in some ways are being randomly generated. We, we're still not sure entirely why, but there isn't a, um, it's not a program. There is just this random damage that occurs and some cells senesce, some don't. And as a consequence, tissues can vary enormously in how much senescent, how many senescent cells they accumulate over their lifetime. So that's interesting, the same, right? Same, uh, <laughs> same type of mouse, same cage, same food, same yeah, conditions, yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah. Well, about, I mean, it's like life, it... right? You you step off the sidewalk and you get hit by a car. I mean, who who, who could have predicted that, right? It, it's it, there isn't a, a, a an element of unpredictability about aging that uh, we still don't completely understand. We do know, though. That on average, on average, if you exercise, you postpone a lot of age-related diseases, or if you have a healthy diet, or if you smoke, you accelerate certain age-related diseases. So on average, we have a good feeling for what moves the needle one way or the other. But when it comes to, to really understanding on an individual basis, predicting your lifespan, not people like you, but you in particular, uh, we're not there yet in any part of medicine, for that matter. Have Have you um, seen studies where they've, for instance, tried to look at um, a mouse's personality? You know, I'm sure sh- some mice are shy, <laughs> some are gregarious, some are aggressive. Is there yeah. any variability there? Because let's say an aggressor would either be more stressed or a very timid one, maybe aggressed against in the cage and attacks a lot, and yeah. maybe that changes their health or, you know, have you looked at that? Is there any role of, of personality in, uh, in aging? Um, to my knowledge, there are really no good measures of mouse personality. Um, it, it requires so much subjective um, interpretation of data. Uh, in people, there there is, you know, there's anecdotal evidence. People who meditate tend to be healthier. Um, You always have to take epidemiological studies with a grain of salt because you never really can control everything like we can with mice. Um, There is a growing bit of data, though, that suggests that certain types of brain activity in a mouse, which is a little bit easier to measure than, say, personality, uh, can have either positive or negative effects on health. For example... Some studies have been done looking at, in particular, cancer uh, cancer spread, the, the ability of a cancer to progress. And it turns out that if you take a mouse and you house it the way we typically house mice, usually four to five mice in a cage, um, they may have a little bits of paper, a little things that they can play with, but not much. So it's a pretty boring environment. But you can also take mice, the same number of mice, and put them in a much larger cage where they have lots of things to distract them, little running wheels and bells and whistles, tunnels they can go through and, and explore. And it turns out that those mice in the enriched environment tend to do much better. Their cancers tend to progress much more slowly than the mice in the less enriched cage. And in some cases, it's even clear that the brain makes proteins that can travel throughout the body and affect the health of the body. So this is still very, very new and, again, incompletely understood. But it's a growing area of beginning to think of the brain not so much as this isolated thing that's above the neck, but as something that can affect distal parts of the body and also contribute to either its health or its disease state. So, yeah, so presumably personality 
will play a role because that will certainly affect your brain activity, but we're just not at the stage where we can say anything definitive. Okay. And you, um, last point, I, you talked about eating McDonald's, not just sitting on the couch, but eating McDonald's, for instance. What about diet? I would think that would affect yeah. aging tremendously. Yeah. Have you other studies where mice are fed, you know, the equivalent of McDonald's versus, uh, you know, high yeah. grade health yeah. and great food? What happens with them? Yeah, so that it's very clear that if you put mice on certain diets that would be considered, you know, the McDonald diet of people, um, they do poorly. They they don't live as long. They develop chronic diseases at an accelerated rate. Um, and it's also clear that there are some diets, this the so-called ketogenic diet, which is low carb, um, high fat, but not animal fat. High, yeah, high fat. Um, and protein, some protein, but not a lot of protein, that those animals tend to live longer. There's a couple of papers that will come out showing that. I should point out, though, that in all cases, the the lifespan extension due to modulating diet, whether it's total calories or quality of the diet, while it's real, and there's no question, it's modest. I mean, we're talking 10 to 20 percent increases in lifespan. Now, in human terms, that's quite a few years, right? But a, a, a still a major issue in the field of aging that we don't understand is what regulates maximum lifespan. You know, there's never been a human that has lived past 122 years of age. That was Jean-Marie Calman, but even she was probably an outlier. Most I mean, the the upper limit for human longevity has been estimated to be somewhere around 115 years. And for a mouse, it's somewhere around three or four years. And we don't know what evolution did to turn a mouse with its three to four year lifespan into a human with its 100 to 120 year lifespan. And if it were a simple gene or a couple of genes, we probably would have discovered those genes by now. So it's more likely that evolution tweaked lots of little things to push longevity out. And we, we don't know, we don't have a good handle on that. And we don't even know if it will be possible for us to do the same thing, to tweak all those little parts um, in a way that we could extend maximum longevity. So I'm not saying we can't. I'm just saying at this point in time, we don't know if we can. We don't have enough information. Yeah, it's, it's true. Why do different creatures have different radically different lifespans, you know, right. what creatures on earth have the longest lifespan and, you know, have there been studies of, let's say, parrots and mice and flies versus people versus tortoises or other creatures that live maybe a very long time? And are they seeing yeah. any difference in why some live so much longer? Yeah, it is it is still mostly a mystery. I mean, there have been people who have looked, for example, at elephant tissues and they find extra copies of genes that um, protect against cancer in those creatures compared to humans, but you know we we it, it's hard to do critical experiments. I mean, mice are wonderful because they're small and their genetics is extremely well known. But for example, if we wanted to test the hypothesis that those extra copies of that tumor suppressor gene was responsible for the longevity of elephants. We would have to have a colony of elephants, number one. Number two, we would have to be able to genetically engineer those elephants, which we can't do at this point. We could in theory, but in in practice, it would be very difficult. And three, we would have to do an experiment that lasts 120 years. (laughs) So, you know, these are very, very difficult things to nail down. Makes sense. Okay. Well, just last last couple of questions. Um, So what's what is your guess? I mean, no one knows, but what do you think will happen with your research and other research around you in the next few years? And then what do you think is possible in the next 20 or 30 years? Yeah, well, of course, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. And the beauty of science is that it always surprises us. So everything I say should be taken with a large grain of salt. You might as well ask me what the stock market will do in the next three years. And if I give you an answer and you believe me, you're crazy, right? No one knows. But that being said, I can see where our research is going because it's 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 happening. The idea is to develop drugs, compounds 
or interventions that have the ability to either cause those cells to go away, to die, or to have those cells stop secreting the bad stuff. I, I think that's feasible. We're, we're doing it in mice now, and I think it's a matter of time before that can be translated to something useful in, in people. 20 to 30 years from now, I, I very much doubt there will be big differences in maximum lifespan among humans. But what I do think will be possible is healthier lives. As you know, the last decade, five to 10 years of people who live a long time is often not very pleasant. They just walk through a nursing home and I think everyone will understand what I mean. And I I think the idea now is not so much to try to make people live longer, but to make them live healthier so that the period of disability is compressed. In fact, we have to do that because the cost of keeping people alive for those last five to 10 years is enormous. It's just breaking the bank. And so the big push now, I think, is to push back and maybe even suppress the ability of people, uh, not the ability, the, the unfortunate of the circumstances of people literally falling apart mentally and physically um, for the last several years of their life. You you probably know who uh, Thurgood Marshall is, the first black Supreme Court justice. Yeah. Black Supreme Court justice, exactly. So, you know, of course, this is a lifetime appointment, and I don't remember how it came up about how long he plans to live. But his response is, is just beautiful. He said, well, I plan to die at 110 from a bullet wound from a jealous husband. <laughs> yeah, I guess there's better ways to go, essentially, than, than where you end well, up. You keep going, going. Well, I mean, isn't isn't that how we'd all like to go, <laughs> in a way? Or, you know, you're on the tennis True. court and you have a massive heart attack, but you were winning, <laughs> you know? This is, I think, the goal. This is, and I think, I think we're going to start seeing that there's some problems with treating aging per se. Um, one of them is just regulatory. The FDA doesn't recognize aging as a disease, so you can't have a drug that's an anti-aging drug. Um, but there are people who are trying to change that. Who are working with the FDA. There are going to be some uh, interesting trials for medications that people are already taking to see if they can follow now those patients with other for other age related diseases to see if those drugs are in fact anti aging or at least anti debilitating um so we're going to see changes in i would say in the next 5 to 10 years yeah, well very good well i appreciate uh you know, your time and, and your answering the questions and i guess the old joke is uh studying aging never gets old there's so much to it. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, well, it was a pleasure well, talking coming. with you. Go ahead. Thank you. Bye bye. You have been listening to Almost Here, Around the Corner Future Technology Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Subscribe to this podcast, post a review, to discover more future technologies that are poised to transform our lives for better or worse, such as Bitcoin, artificial intelligence. 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more.